Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome. The Climate Reality Initiative began about a year ago. It is a private sector-led initiative in Sri Lanka and where Climate Reality LK is concerned, simply with the understanding, the realization that as businesses, we have no option but to form a part of the solution. And whilst businesses have in the past been significantly a part of the problem, and still are to, to a great extent, businesses can also be a part of the solution. The principle of climate reality and what we hope as Dilma Conservation and UNGC to, to achieve is to build a collaboration amongst scientists, amongst government, and the private sector. And so the role that we have is to harness the solutions to the most pressing problems of inequality, of uh, global warming in this instance, and to bring them across in a, in a, in a forum where we would have the three parties uh, represented. It's unfortunate that typically we have this huge wealth of knowledge of science that is locked up in academia, in the minds of formidable scientists, and unfortunately never really either accepted or acted upon by the private sector. And so our role as UNGC and Dilma Conservation is to unlock that potential. We're all in the same boat today. I think we have great clarity of that when looking at what's happening in the Amazon, in Bolivia, and so on today. And so with that, I um, want to express my appreciation on behalf of uh, UNGC and Dilma Conservation for your presence here. This is part of a series of climate reality events where we hope to present not so much the fearful figures and uh, uh, um, create more worry, but rather to focus on the solutions. Now, in that context, Dr. Ranil Senanayaka is someone who I'm particularly pleased to have as part of this series. He obtained his PhD as a systems ecologist at UC Davis, University of California, Davis, in uh, 78, and he worked with Professor Michael Sule, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, the US biologist who was one of the earliest promoters of conservation biology. And so uh, he is uh, Sri Lanka and, in fact, South Asia's first systems ecologist. He's the author of uh, numerous scientific papers, presentations. He served on the UNEP uh, uh, committee that produced the comprehensive uh, uh, global biodiversity assessment. Dr. Senanayaka also has a very unique project which I need to mention. It's known as analog forestry. Many of you may know of it. It mimics the natural forest and strengthens rural communities socially and economically by nurturing tree species and providing commercial products, looking at the humanitarian and the environmental sides. He has field tested analog forestry in Sri Lanka, in Bandaravela, I believe, through, the, through his uh, uh, through the nonprofit uh, entity N NSRC, that's the Neosynthesis Research Center. And he's uh, brought together like minded scientists and conservations around this concept. In the late 70s, he worked uh, for the government of Sri Lanka, attached to the Mahavali Ministry. Um, he is a researcher, university teacher, activist, and, uh, well, interestingly, he started his uh, uh, career in tea, for which, uh, which I'm very pleased to, to hear. He's uh, been a consultant to various governments, uh, UN agencies, development organizations, and so on. He's a senior, he's held senior positions as a lecturer in uh, Melbourne and Monash universities to fine uh, establishments, executive director of the Global Network uh, Environmental Liaison Center International in uh, Kenya, and as a scientist to Counterpart International based in uh, Washington, D.C. But today he's here in his capacity as chairman of Rainforest Rescue International. It's a nonprofit organization. It's based in Gaul. And what he does is working to protect vulnerable communities through ecosystem restoration, development uh, of sustainable livelihoods, and, and so on. He's also on the advisory board of the Living Planet Foundation in the U.S., um, and a patron of Lanka Organics. Dr. Senanayaka also has a very interesting uh, lineage. He uh, comes from one of the uh, 
uh, a very old and very respected family in Sri Lanka. His grandfather was F.R. Senanayaka, a leading figure in the Sri Lankan independence movement uh, and initiator of the temperance movement. His grand uncle was the famous D.S. Senanayaka, first prime minister of uh, independent Ceylon from 1948 to 52. And his father, Upali Senanayaka, was instrumental in developing the Sarvodaya movement and the National Heritage Movement, both which uh, serve Sri Lanka extremely well. Dr. Senanayaka, welcome. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, all. You see, I'm quite a Luddite when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> Living in the jungle has its prices. <laughs> okay, let's go. So, today, the invitation was for me to talk about soil. And uh, I'd like to bring some aspects of soil to share with you. I think it's critical and really important, not only for all of us who are interested in agriculture, but for all of us interested in the well-being of the country itself. Now, there is a triad whose health impacts the health and well-being of all humanity. It's mostly air, water, and soil. But the problem with this is that these three are also common to all of us, to the whole planet. And it suffers from the aspect that was first enunciated by Aristotle, who said, that which is common to all gets the least attention. So as a consequence, the global commons of air the global commons of water, and the global commons of the soil has been systematically abused, ignored, and eroded. While all these areas need attention, today I will focus my attention on soil. And uh, please be aware that later on I'll probably speak there are the fora on these other two aspects also. Soil okay, is generally considered as a surface to walk upon or build upon. The ecological service that a soil provides is never considered in any quote unquote development planning. And this has allowed an incalculable loss of biodiversity and sustainability. And for all of us who are interested in these two themes, biodiversity and sustainability, the poor knowledge of soil with our administrators has led to shocking losses, as I will demonstrate how this can happen. Soil is often called the living skin of our planet. What does it mean, the living skin? Let me show you something. This is Amazonia. And uh, we all know what's happening there now. What happens normally is that right at the back is the rainforest. So the loggers come in and they cut parts of it and they take the timber out. Little bit is left. Then the farmers come in and try to put some cattle in it, has some grass, doesn't work very well, and they cut the trees down, those trees down too. Then some farmers come and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. They clear everything and say, we can grow a crop. And they grow an annual crop on it. And eventually, that washes down, and you're left with the subsoil, the bare bones. This is what is meant by the skin. This is the living skin of our planet. And this is the process by which we are reducing the air flows. OK. Now, I'd like to share with you, and I promise this is going to be the last long reading I'm going to do here. But I'd like to share with you something that came to us from 1862 when the soils of this country, the forests of this country, were being taken down much more violently than that. 
This is from Frederick Lewis, 64 years in Ceylon, and he's talking about 1926, when he just got here. He says, I know of no more awe-inspiring sight than that of a thousand acres on fire. Sheets of flame appear to leap into the air and yell with a sort of devilish delight at their victory over the magnificent trees that they're reducing into charred masses of cinder and charcoal. It is more than impressive. It is fearful, yet grand. After the fire has completed its work, the land is covered with black logs, lumps of charred timber, masses and often fragments of stone broken by the heat that has swept over them. He says, a deep melancholy came over me. When morning broke upon the next day, the events recorded at the conclusion of the last chapter, this is from his book, I found myself gazing upon a scene not altogether unfamiliar to me. All around me lay hundreds of charred black logs, stumps in fantastic shapes and outlines, fallen branches broken and distorted by the fire, cinder heaps and little rivulets of sodden ash, all indicative of the fierce, merciless fire that but a few weeks ago had raged over a spot so lately that had so lately been a beautiful forest land that covered the landscape, impressive but depressing. It was now a blackened wilderness to be changed into fields for coffee. By, by the labor and patience of man, a strange picture, indicating fascinating in one respect, fearful in another, yet so full of strange mixture of possibilities was this wild heap of ruins, this uncouth mass of slaughtered giants, of an inarticulate yet eloquent world to be transformed by industry in the pursuit of fleeting wealth. This is what happened to the mountain forests of Sri Lanka that were inviolate for probably over 20 million years. And when the forest is lost, it burns all the life in the topsoil. The living skin that we discussed before is reduced to ashes, and the protection from erosion is then gone. And then the rains come. And the rains come. So, the topsoil is gone, and now the subsoil is eroding away. So we go into our hills and see what's left behind after the forest was gone, after the coffee was gone, and now we have tea. If you took a look at these pictures, you will see that in most of our lands, there's, in tea lands, there's no A horizon. There's merely the B horizon. When we clear a new clearing, as the pitch in the middle shows, we clear absolutely everything, and we clear it down to the B horizon. The picture on this side is an eroded field, and that's what much of our estates are. That shows you a very fine, fertile field of VPT, but you see that the soil is slumping, is collapsing. Why? There are reasons, and I will go into this as we go into our discussion. So, for the moment, let me say that we in Sri Lanka are in a serious problem as far as our mountain soils and most of our soils are concerned. Now, why should this be so? See, in soil, there's something that we have pretty well forgotten and ignored. And it is the organic matter in the soil. If you go to a good soil, and if you cut a good soil, like here, you'll see the A horizon, the black bit, or the dark band, and then there's the B horizon, and that's the horizon where the roots of the plants and the microorganisms work on to change it into an A horizon. And then there's the C horizon, the parent rock. So, when we look at soil and soil carbon, 
it's an area that has been ignored by much of soil science. Soil science looks at the, the <coughs> structure of the soil, the fertility of the soil, yes, but the soil carbon is generally ignored because it's very diminutive. It ranges from about 0.1% to about 10% maximum in proportion. But this is the fraction. This bit is the engine that drives all of agriculture. Let me take a, um, a quote from Krasilnov who says, the principal property of soil fertility is determined by biological factors, mainly by microorganisms. The development of life in the soil endows it with the property of fertility. What is he saying? Let's look at it. When you look at a soil, a living soil, it's extremely active and is full of life. So much so that if I took a gram, gram of soil, just enough to cover my thumbnail and look into it, I would find in this gram of soil one to two billion cells of bacteria, individual cells of bacteria, sharing that same space with, this, with the bacteria in this gram of soil is 100 to 200 million individual cells of actinomycetes. This is called ray fungi. All of you know this. All of you know actinomycetes. You know how? After the dry period, when the rains come, you smell the earth, that's the spores of the actinomycetes because they are the microorganisms that work during dry times, and when the rains come, they release their spores. And so most of you know them because you smell them. Right. Now, in this same, same space, in this same one grain, you have fungi whose, if we put them end to end, their hyphae will give us one to two kilometers of length in this same one gram of soil. In addition to all this, there are thousands of algal cells, there are thousands of nematodes, there are columbolis, there are microarthropods, there are worms. So that one gram of soil is actually almost a world in and of itself, just one gram of soil. Now, people who have worked on it, Allison, for instance, accounts that just on bacteria alone, you have 5,000 to 1,100 kilograms of living matter in the first 15 centimeters of soil. So if you look at this, this accounts for a mass of about 7,000 to 14,000 kilograms of living organisms living in a hectare of soil, upper 15 centimeters of good farmyard soil. This is actually the equivalent of about 20, 20 horses or two elephants living in, in this every hectare of soil. Consider what it means. It means this is, there is microbial action. They're tiny, but the action is all chemical action that goes on transformations in the soil. Now, a mass that is equivalent to about 20 horses will basically give you roughly about 20 horsepower of energy in your soil, day and night, if you maintain a living, healthy soil. This is how agriculture progressed through the centuries. This is what we used for agricultural productivity. This is the energy, the biological energy of a living soil. And then what happened? Oh, the revolting green revolution. 
right? They came in and said, hey, you know, stick this nice thing in the ground, you get double the crop, just put some fertilizer. You put the fertilizer and then uh, the plants didn't do extremely well and the insects came to eat it off, spray some pesticide. Right. While that part went on, and that's another whole area we have to talk about, poisoning ourselves, but while that went on, putting fertilizer on an ecosystem does something. It's an axiom in ecological science that energy flow through an ecosystem tends to organize and simplify that ecosystem. So what happens is, the moment we put external energy as artificial fertilizer into the soil, only a few species of the wealth of bacteria and organisms that I showed you can use it. And they expand and proliferate in the soil. The rest of it, 80%, disappear because they cannot then compete in this new high energy environment. And then what happens? The weight of the biological material the living soil starts to go down. Slowly, as the external energy is applied, the soil starts losing its capacity to work and produce the nutrient. As this goes down for the farmer, it's impossible to grow a crop now because the soil is lost, the fertility is lost. So the farmer then is doomed forevermore to get artificial fertilizer and keep putting it on the soil, otherwise they are not going to get a crop. This is why when people do organic agriculture, they say you've got to wait three years. What are they waiting for? What they're waiting for is to try and build up that soil ecosystem back again so that they can have productivity. It's simple, it's fundamental. We are the ones who have damaged ourselves. We saw the magic that technology brought to us and then, wow, excellent. They're going to get double the crop, triple the crop. <laughs> our soil paid the price for it. And if our soil pays the price for it, we pay the price for it. Now, let me show you a soil profile from the Uwa. For us, native forest struggling to come back. If you look at it, the air horizon is just forming and it needs a lot of attention to have it form and make it deeper, it's struggling. It's very dry there, fires go through there every couple of years and reduce the capacity of the soils. There's no control of fire on our hills at all. So, we do have a problem. In addition to that, Heat is a major problem, like I told you, in our soils. And not only our soils. But then, because of our modern living, because of using fossil fuels for industry, using fossil fuels for agriculture, we have been releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Fossil carbon dioxide. Right? And it has now begun poisoning the global commons of our air, like we all know it's happening right now. Today it's well over 411 parts per million. And if you look at the global temperature, the addition of the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide through the burning of fossil fuels has initiated a crisis in the global commons. And this is manifest in a shift, a shift from the norm. And all of us now have experienced shifts from the norm. We get more rain when it should be no rain. We get no rain when there should be rain. You know what's happening with the temperature. So with the small shift, what happens is the extreme becomes the norm. So what was once record hot weather, suddenly as the norm shifts, becomes even more 
record hot weather. Why is this so important? As I said, it has bearing on the soil and the soil microorganisms, etc. But there is another huge danger that is before us. This. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am tragically sad to tell you that this was a part of the Sri Lankan country statement at the COP21. Many years ago now, all right? What this shows is that once the heat temperature goes up beyond 37 degrees, chlorophyll, which is an enzyme, becomes denaturing, starts to break up. The more that higher the temperature goes, the, the more the chlorophyll breaks down until you reach, if you go past 44, 45, that's the end of productivity. Plants will not produce anymore. All over the world, right now, with the temperatures going out, be it Australia with the wheat, or be it India or Pakistan, as soon as the temperatures get very high, they have a lot of high temperature days, crop is down. Why? Chlorophyll. In, the, in Siberia, in the northern latitudes, where they're having these huge peaks of temperature going up and down, the pines can't take it. They're starting to die. Heat stress. We should have been thinking about this five, six years ago, when it was a part of our country statement, but um, it's tragic that our bureaucracy and our politicians still haven't considered these things. I mean, how dumb can we be? This is our country. This is production. This is what, you know, we are agriculturists. We are not aware of this. And now, sadly, the new studies coming out are, are pointing out that if it goes beyond, regularly, if it goes beyond 48, that's it. That's it. We are not going to be able to live. No more sort of sustainability. Forget it. We are not going to be alive. This is the reality that's happening today. And all of you have seen the papers. All of you have seen the TV. You know that in Pakistan now it's already gone up to 50. This is the reality about us now. I mean, at the moment here, we are acting like planet Lanka. You know, in planet Lanka, we are a different planet. As happened planet Earth, oh, it won't happen to us. We are planet Lanka. No, we are not planet Lanka. We are part of planet Earth, and it's going to happen to us until these, unless these people take some action now. They can't stop it, but they can mitigate it, and they can help the people not suffer as much when this happens. Okay, sorry, back to the soil. Put my head back into the soil. Okay, this is what happens in the soil. These are earthworms. They are what we call indicator organisms. They demonstrate that as the temperature goes up, their activity too starts to go down. And what can you do in the soil? One important thing is trees and how we use trees. Because soil is made mostly by the roots of trees and plants. All trees, all trees all over the planet provide up to 20% of their total root weight as exudates that they put into the surrounding soil. Now, why would an organism put all this stuff into the soil? Carbohydrates and sugars constantly feed in the soil. Because it's feeding the soil around it, it requires a healthy soil ecosystem for that tree to survive. Trees and plants create the soil that they grow in. Another thing that has, we've missed greatly. One meter of tree root 
has wrapped around it and extending out from it, fungal hyphae. All trees have sp special fungi, AV fungi, that are found only for those species, particularly. Now, a fungal, fungal hyphae can, from one meter of tree roots, can extend over a kilometer. What are they doing? They're looking for nutrients. They bring the nutrients back into the tree and water back into the tree. The tree feeds them with the carbohydrates and the sugars. Now, each tree, as I said, provides different chemical compounds. And many species have distinct species associated with them. So unless you have a diversity of trees, you're never going to produce a healthy soil. If any of you have gone up and see the monocultures of pinus and the eucalyptus and whatever, you know, you take, look at the soil. They can't make it because just one type of tree will not make a soil. And we got a forest department. Oh God, help us. Okay. Anyway. Uh, uh. Uh, you know, when you see what's happening to this country, what do you do? Yeah. Okay, why do we need a living soil? Because the microorganisms help us greatly in detoxifying the garbage that we put on it, the pesticides and the agrotoxins. Here are some of the ways that they do it. They, they use sorption, the hydrolysis, decomposition, and, and this is why we require living soil if we are going to address the agrotoxins that we have. But there's something else, and it's even more important, and it takes you back and takes us back to the slide I showed you of that nice tea um, estate, good VP, good cover, and the soil is sliding down. Why? You see, soil maintains its stability by the soil particles being bound together by bacterial gums and colloids. There's two things here. Bacterial gums are some of the strongest substances known. And colloids, jelly is a colloid. Colloids are things produced by bacteria that when water comes, they swell up. And then that makes it, plants find it very easy to take the nutrients of the colloids. So in a healthy soil, there's a lot of colloids that helps to feed the plants. In a healthy soil, there's a lot of bacterial gums that help to bind the soils. Now, when the roots are gone, and then there's no food for the soil. And when there's no food for the soil, there is no bacteria to form the colloids and the gums. And then the soil falls apart. Now, here's an example of what's going on. See, the roots have gone through the soil, and the bacteria have and expanded around the roots, of course, and they have created the gums, and they have bound this thing, so now this sand block is almost like a rock. When the roots die, they leave the hollows behind. Water travels through the hollows. Bacteria forms in the hollows. Organic matter begins to happen. And the creation of soil then begins. This is how trees and plants begin the process of creation of the soil. Now, if you take these things out, at least now, if you have some roots, whatever plant you have, at least is doing some feeding of the soil. Once you take them out, and what happened to us in our mountains is we took most of our deep-rooted trees and plants out maybe 100, 150 years ago, right? And we are freewheeling nicely, and now we are coming to the skid. And that's why you see the slumping happening all over our mountains. And that is being helped by bad land use practices. They remove the tree, the tea, and they put vegetables. And as soon as a little rain comes, you see that thing there? That whole hillside goes down. I don't care. 
they made some money on the vegetables, it's done. This attitude towards our soil must stop. It's just treated like it's just a lump to be used. There's no respect for it. Our farmers did. Before they went to the fields, what did they do traditionally? They liked the lamp, they said the puja, they worshipped the soil, and they begin. Respect. Because with the topsoil gone, here's the future. As soon as the organic matter goes, then the clay goes, not much chance. Now, we've got a warming world. We've got a world where chlorophyll is now going to be compromised. We've got a world where the soil is being compromised. And we are going at it, cutting it and bringing it down like it never existed. What can we do? Well, some of us are working and uh, as you see, we can start building soil. These are organic tea estates. They're working very hard to try and bring back the soil. Um, when you do this, you can indeed initiate or begin the process. But you must follow through with the knowledge that I was just shared with you on what the soil really is. The, the compost that we make is the new base, it's the new substrate, it's the new food we start putting into our soils. But just putting the compost alone does not help. You have to have the long-term inputs into your soil planned. Your tree crops must be there. Your coal crops must be there. And this is how. And the indicators must be there to indicate what we're doing. But we have to build our soils up to a point when the life comes back, the worms come back, and you know what I hope, what I hope with the soil is maybe one day re regain what we lost. You know, this slide epitomizes what we lost. What you see here are earth snakes, cylindrophis and rhinophis. This country has the largest, largest diversity of earth snakes anywhere in the world for its size. What it shows, earth snakes are the top predators of the soil. They're like the whales of the soil. What this shows is that this country had a soil that was like ocean, like that. Once we have reptiles, we have amph amphibians, Ethiopians, specialized to live in the soil. And today, none of those creatures can live in the deep operate, a horizonless hot soils we have in our mountains. You only find them in little holes and hollows and a little remnant forest and that's it. So maybe if we pay attention to our soils and begin to grow it again, pay attention to it again, maybe then we can have space for this kind of biodiversity now to come back and retain its place in this country. But the evolution of a living soil needs time, needs time. Because when you begin, you begin down at the sea horizon. You have to slowly grow plants that deepen the soil and start putting the organic matter that's required and building it up until you find a robust A horizon and then a good B horizon that is activating under it over the C horizon. It can be done, but it takes time. And one of the ways that we have found in our experience that's useful in growing soil is to grow a diverse forest. So looking at that, we looked at the growing of the forests that ensures the growing of the soil. In this graph, you will see how a forest forms. You cut a forest, leave it alone, 
the grasses come, after the grasses the shrubs come, after the shrubs the big trees come, etc. Human beings, us, humanity, we have processes analogous or, sim or similar to that. At the first cereal stage, we have agriculture of annual crops. Then we look at it and say, oh, that's not enough, we need a few trees in this thing. Then we go to agroforestry. And then we say, oh, that's still not enough. We need the shrubs and something more complex. And then we go into permaculture. And then we look at it and say, hey, wait a minute. Where's the biodiversity that existed here? We've got to bring that back. And what are the structures like? We've got to bring that back. Then you come to analog forestry. And then you look at the natural forest to your design. And in analog forestry, it's a way of restoring forests by creating a tree-dominated ecosystem that is analogous or similar to the original mature ecosystem in architectural structure and ecological function, the most critical of which is primary ecosystem services. We'll talk about that later. And this is how we work. And this is what it looks like. And you look at an analog forest, and this is at Mirahawata in uh, Bandaravela, in Bandaravela. The analog forest design on the left is 90% exotic species, and the analog forest on the right is 100% native species. So, what we have done is we have taken the native forest, we look at the structure and functions, and then we we recreated a similar system, but with things that are analogous, similar to, but giving a crop for the farmer. What we found, what we found was that not only did it give it a stable crop, it also allowed you some insurance against vagaries because you have two or three different crops. So if the market goes down, it helps you to overcome market variability. But more than that, what we found for ourselves, what we were interested in was biodiversity. Amazing. Most of the biodiversity that was missing came back once it grew up. And this analog forest, you see the tree there with the yellow flowers? Three years ago, Forest eagle owls nested in that tree and raised babies. There was nothing there before. It was bare land. This is what we can do. And when we looked at that, we looked at the soil quality in monoculture forests. And the natural forest, and this analog forest. This is the difference in the carbon content. Then we looked at the number of bacterial colonies. And now, I hope, after this earlier presentation, all of you, I hope, are, lit are more sensitive now as to the value of the microorganisms that live in the soil. That is what a soil is in many respects to us. Look at the, dif look at the difference. So there is a monoculture forest of pinus. The natural forest and an analog forest. There is no question. We cannot do this foolishness that we are doing now, just for economic return, oh great, we're getting aid from somewhere, oh great, clear something and stick a monoculture in there and say, oh, you don't forestry. Total rubbish. We have to get away from that. All right. Where to now? The living soil is being lost at the rate of a football field every five seconds around the planet. Every five seconds here, size of a football pit, living solid space. It is being poisoned, it is being built upon, eroded, 
and its energy to sustain us will soon disappear. This, I think, should be in the mindset heart of anyone, even remotely connected to the land. The land, us, and the soil are you know, integrally connected. Okay, how do we begin? What shall we do? What can we do? Well, first, let's look at soil as components of watersheds. I mean, at the moment, we are developing agriculture, we are developing whatever projects we do, without considering, nearly really, without considering that there are management units, natural management units that we should be focusing on, watersheds. This country has 103 of them. And sadly, sadly, 96 of them are polluted. The rivers that flow out of them. So, we have to look at the soil as many, many diverse components of a watershed in terms of soil. But you see, there is a major problem before us, and that is something that I'd like to finally, you know, bring you to. I hope you all appreciate and know what the forest, what the soil is, and how we should be aware of it. But the major problem before us is this. Maintenance and quality is determined by land use. While urbanization is seen as development, the true value of the contributions of the rural sector remain massively discounted and therefore degraded. You know, we are saying urban development, okay, it must be balanced by rural development. You have an urban development authority, we need a rural development authority to negotiate with the urban development authority before they take over rural land. Now they're planning to make a, a track from, from Kalambo to Trincomalee or what? I mean, will they allow this idiocy to happen? Now, look at what happens. Look at what happens. You look at land that is open and allows water infiltration. In that, your soil is alive. In agricultural land, too. As we become more urbanized, what happens? We create impervious surfaces. We stand here on what was once a living soil. Today, it's dead. This building is on it. The roads out there was once on living soil. Today is dead and sealed. We want to make megapolises and urban things and seal the land without paying any attention to the life of the land. Are you mad? I think we have lost our heads. You know, without dealing with the nation as the nation should be dealt with. But to do this, we need knowledge. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping that with this presentation, I have just stirred your imagination and your interest to start looking into this. We owe it to ourselves. And we owe it, of course, to our country. So, we have to do something. I invite questions when I'm finished. But I would also like at this moment, because I have worked many years in this field, been extremely frustrated by telling people what we, they should do, and even setting up the models, which people don't come to. I'll tell you a story this model that I showed you on analog forestry, we've been there for 32 years. I've had people come for training and learn how to handle their environments and build them up from South America, from Africa, from Europe, from America, from Canada, from Asia, from India, 
from Australia. The only people who haven't come there yet for the last 32 years are representatives of the government of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Right? That should tell you something. So I said, okay, forget it. They're not going to help us. So I made a private company. It's called Earth Restoration. We'll be launching soon. In the next, our website is out, but the new website will be on. And that is where people can invest, or people can come in there, in primary ecosystem services. It's a new economy we are trying to build, like analog forestry. This too began in Sri Lanka. I've just come back from Myanmar. We've just set up earth restoration in Myanmar right now. The world is getting interested. And uh, I invite all of you, when we announce our launch, a soft launch actually, but uh, presenting a company, uh, to attend. In the meanwhile, I'll say thank you very much for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. <laughs>